Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon afternoon to hear the Word of God. I'd like to read again from 1 John. I'm going to read uh, the first four verses again of chapter 1. Uh, although we read them last night, we didn't quite make it to verse 1, really. We kind of were doing an overview of the book a little bit, uh, but hopefully we'll get into the text itself this time in more detail. And so beginning in verse 1, it says this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. And again, God will bless that short reading of his precious word to us. Our last hymn was very appropriate because it kept saying, I know, I know. And there were people in John's day that were also saying, I know, I know. They were called the Gnostics. And they thought they knew more than had been revealed in Scripture. You see, everything we know, we know it because God has revealed it to us in His Word, and we believe that. But these people said, well, we are actually in a bit advance of you. We have a knowledge that goes beyond just what's written in the Word of God. We have, you know, we have some special insights that you guys don't have. And so uh, part of the reason that John, after decades of silence, really, we don't hear much from him. As we said yesterday, he kind of disappears off the page of Scripture at the end of the book, of, uh, early in Acts, or really Acts chapter 4, and we don't really hear much of him. But all of a sudden, after decades of silence, he picks up his pen. And he picks up his pen to deal with the false views that were being promulgated in his day by uh, individuals uh, found, founded by Simon Magus, Uh, The Simon uh, that we read about in Samaria in Acts chapter 8, he went down to Alexandria. He began to teach this false teaching. He had a big disciple called Corinthus. And Corinthus was an individual who John, uh, well, in fact, uh, Irenaeus said that this epistle was written by John to refute the teaching of Corinthus. So we, we know a little bit about the background from some of these early church fathers. And what we know is that this special knowledge that these people claim to have manifested itself in different ways. It manifested itself in different ways in their, their personal life, their life experience, but then also in how they viewed the person of Christ. And uh, it, it had two different kind of outworkings in terms of their personal life. They uh, because they believed, you see, that that matter, the material things, were evil. And, of course, that includes the body. Our body is material. In fact, uh, apparently, uh, if you were to look at our body, it's kind of the same uh, chemical makeup as dirt. We're just clay, right? The first man, Adam, <laughs> it really means clay, really. We're just a, God made us out of a lump of clay. And so, you know... That clay is material, it's it's matter. And so uh, this idea of matter being evil, uh, that affected how they view Christ, and it also affected how they view the Christian experience as they describe themselves as Christians. Although I do believe, and John believed, that they were bogus in their claim to be Christians. But one of the ways it it appeared was uh, an, an asceticism. Because material things were evil, uh, these people tried to keep as much away from the material as they could. And so you have, like in Colossians 2.21, it says, touch not, taste not, handle not. In other words, stay away from evil material. It's kind of hard in a material world to stay away from material things, right? But they were trying to. Uh, So they had this kind of almost uh, uh, trying to conquer sinful desires uh, beating, it, beating it down, crushing it in order that the emaciated soul may rise to a knowledge of higher things. And so kind of the more you, you kind of neglected the body, the more spiritually you'd be in tune with God. That was kind of one view that came out of this Gnostic teaching. Another view 
was just the opposite, the libertines. And what they said is, well, <clears throat> long as our spiritual life is in con kind of in relationship with God, it doesn't really matter how we live. Now, in fact, you can sin all you want as long as you acquire knowledge in the process. Believe it or not, I actually met somebody who espoused that view. They, they said they don't think there's anything, uh, such a thing as sin. Uh, what they said was, as long as you learn from the experience. I said, so if you go and murder me, uh, it's not wrong as long as you learn something. Is that what you're trying to say to me? And that's exactly what they said. It's amazing to believe, isn't it, that people think this kind of stuff. But that's what was the practical manifestation. And so as we go through First John, we're going to see a lot of the things that he's saying is, is going to hit directly at these false views of our relationship with God. On the other hand, uh, tragically, uh, this man, uh, Corinthus, had some strange views about the person of Christ as well. Because, see, one of the cardinal doctrines of Christianity is that the eternal son, who ever lived in the bosom of the father, took on a human body, what we call the incarnation. And they really had a problem with that. Because how could a God who they acknowledged to be holy possibly have anything to do with something material like a body and so they had two views one was that the lord jesus wasn't a real man at all yeah, he he just seemed to be he was some kind of a phantom really didn't really have a real body that's a bit strange isn't it we're going to see how john is going to handle that and he's going to talk about it really early on in this epistle that actually he didn't just seem to be he, he would say our hands have handled <laughs> of the word of life we actually touched him we know that he's real and, and then another view uh, which was uh, again uh, got a name called docetism and it basically was that the christ spirit descended upon the man jesus at his baptism and it left him before the cross in the garden, when he prayed, the Spirit left him, and then just the man Jesus suffered on the cross. And so, now it's kind of interesting because uh, you think, well, all this stuff, what's that got to do with us in the 21st century? Well, what's interesting is, back in the 20th century, some of you remember that. Some of us were alive in the 20th century, remember? Uh, in 1982, I'd just been saved one year. It was a very special year. It was the year I got married. But it was a special year in, 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 from, in that way. It was wonderful. But in 1982, there was somebody who paid to have in all the news. Anybody remember what a newspaper was, by the way? Before the Internet, uh, people used to get their news from a newspaper. And, and every major newspaper in the world had a full-page advertisement that said this. The Christ is now here. And actually, I have that in my file somewhere. <laughs> I have a big pile of stuff that needs filing in my files, and it's in there somewhere. I have, I've kept that full-page thing. I just blew my mind. The Christ is now here, and he will reveal himself shortly. And behind it is the New Age teaching that the Christ Spirit came on Jesus, left him before the cross, and will come again on the Messiah of the last days. Now, we know it will be the false Messiah of the last days. So this is not some kind of old, musty teaching that has no relevance. In fact, as we get in these last days, this teaching is going to be more and more relevant because we're going to see some of the manifestations of this thing coming back again in a very clear way. Now, let me just... Uh, say that in terms of first john and analyzing the book uh, paul's writings are very kind of logical thought flow very easy to outline you know you look at romans and it's just it just goes from one point to in a very linear way to another very easy to tell john you read as many commentaries as you like and they all will say the same thing it almost defies analysis it's very hard to kind of outline First John. Part of the reason is that 
John, instead of thinking in a linear way, uh, he, his thinking is more spiral. He kind of goes round in circles. He's going to mention the same truths, and he's going to repeat them throughout the book. And so as we go through the book, you're going to say, well, didn't he already say that in a previous? Well, yeah, I did, because John already did. Then he keep, keeps going around, but it gets higher and higher each time. So it's kind of, that's, that's his style. It's kind of like a winding stake, staircase, always revolving around the same center. And, uh, and so that's kind of the idea. Now, part of what uh, John is going to talk about in his book is because there's all this false teaching, He's going to do something. Some have said this is a good way of looking at John. He's going to give some tests of life. Tests of life. To see whether you really are a child of God. Because you've got all these false views out there. People are embracing these false views. And yet they're all claiming to be Christian. So how do we know who the real Christians are and who the fake Christians are? And so there are going to be some tests of life. And what we're going to see, they're going to come in three different ways. There's going to be a doctrinal test, okay? That's very important. And the doctrinal test is simply this. What think ye of Christ, right? If you've got a wrong view of the person of Christ, you're not a Christian, okay? And so doctrinally, you have to have a right view of the person of the Christ. And so he's going to talk about how do you view Christ? And he's going to bring that through many, and he's going to say, there are many that say, but they're bogus. Secondly, there's a moral test. And the idea is this, that if you're in the family, and John tends to look at things from the viewpoint of the family, and if you're in the family of God, there will be some family resemblance. Right? In other words, you're going to have a reflection of the moral being who has born you again, right? You're going to have some connection, uh, very moral connection, a family resemblance. And then finally, there's a social test. And that is this, do you love the brethren? That's a good test, isn't it? If I'm in the family, I would love those in the same family. And it will be evident that I love those in the same family. And again, these elitists who had this special knowledge, they tended to look down and disdain the ordinary Christians, you see. They had this elitism. And they didn't love the family. In fact, they loved their own little clique, but they didn't really love the family. And so he's giving these, these simple tests, and they're good tests. In fact, we could say this, that uh, in his gospel, he, he writes these things that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life through his name. And in his first epistle, he writes these things that you might know you have eternal life. And so on the one hand, he wants you to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, but he doesn't want false professors. He wants you to know, as we just sang, I know, I know. He wants you to know for sure that you have eternal life. And so he's giving these tests of life. So you can evaluate, am I really born of God? Is there evidence in my life that I'm a, a new creature? Uh, do I have a right view of the person of Christ? Do I have a family resemblance of, of a changed life? Is it evident to, a, to people that I'm in the family of God because I have a, a reflection of a, the God I worship? And then uh, do, I, um, do I pass the social test? Do I love the brethren? And so those are some of the things we're going to be looking at now. I just want to give you some of the key words before we jump in, because it's always good to notice uh, the key repeated words and phrases. Now, as we go through this uh, gospel uh, or this uh, epistle, and I'm going to take my jacket off if you don't mind, because it's rather hot up here. And um, we, we will notice um, that uh, he uses words that we're very familiar with from his gospel. He uses the word world 23 times. He uses the word love, as you would expect, 21 times. He uses the word light six times. The word know 35 times, because these guys are always talking about knowledge, and so he says, okay, let's talk about knowledge. And for 35 times he does that. Uh, other phrases that we need to uh, observe from the beginning, nine times. Commandments, 13 times. And so manifested five times. So there's a lot of kind of repetition. I, I'd love to do that, by the way. I highly recommend it. If you are going to study any book in the Bible, go through and look for the repeated words and phrases 
keep a note of them, underline them. The point is this, the Holy Spirit wants us to get it. And he recognizes that some of us, in order to get the message, need repetition. And so he will repeat key thoughts, ideas, phrases over and over again. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. I did go to Bible school, and I, in Bible school, I did do Bible study methods. And, you know, the amazing thing is what is, I found to be the most important tool I was never taught in Bible study methods. Look for repetition. I thought, wow, how did they miss that one? <laughs> that, that's, and, and it took me a long time to get it. And finally, when I got it, I thought, wow, it's like looking at the Bible in a fresh light all over again. And it just like opened up my understanding of the scriptures in ways I never realized. And so like, how did they miss that? I don't know, but they did. So there we go. Uh, but it's there and it's very helpful. So let's now get into the the introduction. The first four ver uh, verses are really the pr prologue, the introduction. Uh, notice fellowship is a key idea. Uh, in fact, in this first chapter, it's mentioned four times, twice in chapter three. It's mentioned in chapter six, uh, it, sorry, in verse three, verse six. Uh, it's mentioned, verse seven, it's mentioned. So clearly fellowship is a key idea in these opening verses. So it begins this way. He says, that which was from the beginning. Quite an unusual way to begin when he's actually speaking about the word of life. <laughs> but that's the way he begins, that which was from the beginning. And uh, that's the subject matter that he wants to deal with. Of course, we've got to ask ourselves, now what beginning does he mean when he says that which is from the beginning? And that's not a simple answer because there's several beginnings in the scriptures. Of course, uh, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth, right? So we have what we consider to be the beginning of space, time, and matter as we know it, okay? And so that's when the world began as we know it, our, our world, our universe, when God spoke the world into existence. And by the way, I believe, I'm one of those people that believe that it all happened in six 24-hour days. And I've heard all kinds of explanations on why it's, and, and to me, it's a theology of accommodation. It's trying to accommodate to science, falsely so-called, instead of just simply accepting the word of God. And I have no question in my mind I think when the Lord said that the Jews had to rest on the Sabbath day because in 6,000 year periods, the Lord made, no, no, uh, in six days, the Lord made heaven and on the seventh day he rested. And so the Jews were to rest on the seventh day in remembrance of that. And it's just I means pretty common sense. So in the beginning, John chapter one, verse one says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, the word was God. And of course, that's been termed the unbeginning beginning. Because what that means is that when you go back to the beginning, the word was already there. So Genesis 1.1 is when our space-time history begins, but the word was already there. He was there in eternity past. We believe in the eternal sonship of Christ. That, that he, 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 is the, he is the one who is eternal. And so uh, in, in the beginning was the word. Uh, we go back to the beginning. The word was already there and had been there with God as, uh, as God for all eternity past. Father and son enjoying fellowship throughout the ages of eternity, along with the Spirit, the eternal Spirit. And so they existed before our world of space-time history came into being. So again, we go, in the beginning was the Word. And then here, that which was from the beginning. Now, I, I don't think for one minute that John is denying the eternal sonship of Christ. That's not his object here. But in the light of the false teachers coming in with their new ideas... John wants to get a good grip on the teaching which has been around from the beginning of what we would call Christianity. And so it's from the time of the incarnation uh, when, uh, when the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. 
and we beheld his glory. And so he has in view, really, uh, the beginning of the gospel era, the coming of Christ. And, um, you know, we, we also need to use that same approach with false cults. False cults always come, and they've got something additional, right? They want the Book of Mormon. They've got this additional revelation. And we say, no, 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 we, we just believe that which was from the beginning. We're going back to the to the revelation of and the manifestation of Christ when he came into the world. Uh, that's what we're going back to. And, of course, uh, that's what he's talking about, the beginning. So it says, the beginning which we have heard. Now, of course, that's what he's talking about, that, that in the beginning, you see, John was one of the ones that when the Lord Jesus began his public ministry at his baptism, he was the one of the first ones who heard this blessed person speak and so he says that which is from the beginning beginning which we have heard now notice which we have heard he starts with the hearing because faith comes by hearing he didn't say uh, that which we have looked upon and handled no he starts that which we have heard first thing is hearing hearing is the most dependable thing isn't it uh, let me, and I say that for this reason. Um, you remember the story when um, Jacob deceived his father who was blind? And it's interesting that all the other senses were involved. He, he felt, and he felt like he saw. He smelled him, a sense of smell, and he smelled like he saw. But he says, the voice sounds like Jacob. Is that interesting? You see, the hearing is very important. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. God speaks to us, and he uses hearing. That's one of the most important things. And we've got, we better, are we listening? God is speaking, are we listening? How's our, how's, are we tuned to hear from him? And so he says, that which we have heard. And then he says, we have seen. Uh, yes, we, we, we did see with our own eyes. We, we've seen him. Uh, our, he says, not only we've looked upon. So it wasn't just a glance. We actually examined closely this blessed person. And then he says, and again, what a, what a devastating truth to those that say he just seemed to be. <laughs> no, our hands have handled of the word of life. He, he, he was not a phantom. He was real. I actually, John could say, I, could, I put my head on his bosom. I know he was no phantom. He was real. The real manifestation of the eternal Son of God. We heard it. We saw it. We looked upon. We gazed. We examined it closely. Our hands have handled. And so... At the beginning of the era of Christianity, the dawning of the new dispensation, Christ was no phantom. Here is the apostolic testimony. And so what John is saying is, what is new is not true. And what is true is not new. <laughs> that which from the beginning, that's what we hold on to. So the idea is that this eternal subject of John has been audibly heard, physically seen, intentionally studied, tangibly touched, and of course, what enormous implications to his readers in their false teaching. And I, I can't help but think of this, that John, now in his, his 80s, and he, he still is talking about that day when for the very first time he heard the words of Christ. And it's like he's never got over it. And, and he's still got this sense of wonder and amazement. Now, it's interesting because we can't say with John that we saw him with our physical eyes or our hands have handled him. We've, we, all we have done is believed the apostolic testimony. And so Peter would say to us, him whom having not seen, you love. <laughs> and it's true, right? We've ne I've never seen the Lord Jesus. By the eyes of faith, I have seen him and believe him with all my heart. 
But John, he literally did see him, and he's, he wants us to, to affirm to us that, yes, I saw him, I heard him, I handled him, I, I examined him closely. And by the way, he doesn't say it was just him. He says, that which we have heard. He's talking about the apostolic we here. It wasn't just John, the entire apostolic witnesses right that was the reason the apostles were called to be a witness from the baptism of john right through to the very ascension of the lord jesus and these men were witnesses and so he says that which we have heard we have seen he's including the others in the, the others in the testimony and again we again just want to deal with this idea of our hands have handle, handled uh, was it wasn't just the apostles uh, we think of Mary clinging to his feet. We think of even after resurrection. Uh, he, he Again, he wasn't a phantom either. Uh, we were, we're coming up to Easter. He, he, he was a real person. And, and he says uh, to Thomas, uh, thrust your hand in my side. He talks about a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see me have. He was very much a real person, a real man, fully, totally Man, with one simple caution given us in the epistle of the Hebrews, is a man just like we are, apart from one area. Sin apart. He was a sinless man. <laughs> a man who had no sin in him. But a man nevertheless. And so, John says, our hands have handled, and then notice how he describes the Lord Jesus. He says, our hands have handled of the word of life. The word of life. Beautiful description, isn't it? Uh, and of course, um, that's a favorite word of John's, isn't it? This word logos. Uh, it's used by John uniquely, uh, unique to him. And uh, in describing the Lord Jesus, we saw it in John 1.1. 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the logos. Uh, was with God, the Word was God. Uh, the Word became flesh and dwelt, dwelt amongst us. Revelation, when the Lord Jesus comes again uh, on his thigh, is going to be written. Uh, the Word of God, uh, again, he's called the Word of God, Revelation 19, 13. And here, he's called the Word of Life. And so why this emphasis on the Word? And the idea is this, that it conv conveys the idea of vehicle of thought, we use words to convey ideas and concepts, don't we? I'm hoping that the words that I'm using are going to get across the concepts that God wants you to understand during these meetings, right? And I'm using words in the process. And so it's, it's a vehicle of thought. Yeah, it, it's a way of expressing what's on our minds and in our hearts. And the Lord Jesus is ever the one who conveys to us fully the mind and heart of God. Right? You want to know what God is like? Look at the Lord Jesus. He is God's full expression of what, it, what he's like. His son expresses him fully. In fact, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him he has told him out right he's expounded him he has revealed him in all his fullness remember philip lord show us the father what does he say if you philip have seen me you have seen the father i have revealed him in all of his fullness and so that word word of life beautiful beautiful description of the lord jesus and now verse two is kind of a parenthesis because it's in brackets. You notice that in your Bible it says, For the life was manifested, we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. And this little parenthesis is simply saying this, that even though I, John is saying, I've just told you that he was real, he was a real man, but he was a lot more than a man. You see, this is that, eternal life, <laughs> that life that already existed but was manifested, that life was manifested, we have seen it bear witness shown to you, the, the eternal life, in other words, his life did not begin when he was born in Bethlehem of Judea, that life 
was eternal. <laughs> it, it had no beginning. The, the, what we call the eternal sonship of Christ. We go right back into the ages of eternity and he was there. And then at a certain point in history, he was manifested. And so he says that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, John says. Like we, can you imagine the magnitude of what John is saying? Like of all the times in history and all the people that he could manifest himself, he manifested himself, John says, to us. And, and isn't it amazing? Who was John anyway? He's a fisherman <laughs> from Galilee, just an ordinary person. And yet the eternal son manifests himself to people like him and Peter. And now through their testimony, that same person manifests himself to ordinary people like you and I. Isn't it wonderful? That he, that he wants to be known, that he wants to reveal himself, and he's revealing himself to the ordinary people. And that's what he's telling us. We saw it. <laughs> we bear witness now, to these great things. Of course, John, along with the others, were chosen, specially chosen witnesses to reveal to us that eternal life which was with the Father. Now verse 3 says, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And again, I think what he's simply doing is this. He's saying, you know, these false teachers, they're claiming that they've got this elite knowledge and they're so special and all the rest of it. But I want to tell you how special the ordinary Christian really is. The ordinary Christian enjoys fellowship with the apostolic testimony, right? We, we, we believe what they believed, you know, we're, we're just like them. But not only do we believe what they believe, but we've been brought in through their testimony into fellowship with divine persons. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And I keep mentioning it because I don't want to forget the blessed person of the Trinity. He's not mentioned here, uh, but this Holy Spirit is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 13, in 13 verse 8, I believe it is, where it talks about the communion of the Holy Ghost. And so there it is. We're brought into fellowship with divine persons. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, I'm sorry. And so just an amazing thing that all of this special teaching of Gnosticism and Docetism and all that, it totally misses the mark. They claim that they have a knowledge, this special knowledge, but actually they're missing out on the true fellowship with the Father and with the Son that comes from believing that which was from the beginning, the apostolic testimony. And they've got all these clever words and all the rest of it, but they're missing out on the true fellowship that God wants us to enjoy. And so, he says, these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. And I, I, I just want to say this. I think what he's saying is that if you want to experience fullness of joy, which I think we all want to know, fullness of joy, Sometimes I think we lack joy because we've lost the sense of amazement that actually divine persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, actually want our fellowship. And, and that should, I mean, that should light your fire. You should be excited about that. Why would God want anything to do with a person like me? And yet he does, and he wants to enjoy walking with me. Yeah, just like he other men walk with God, he wants to walk with me and he wants to walk with you. And he wants to enjoy communion with us every single day. And, and, and again, we ask the question, have we been enjoying fellowship with divine persons today? Did we start our day like that? Just enjoying fellowship with divine persons? It's amazing to think about. And so let's not lose the wonder of that. And, and I think it, sh it should fill our hearts with joy that, that I actually, you know, I mean, I, I, I couldn't, uh, if I wanted to go and see um, President Biden, um, I mean, it, it wouldn't be an easy thing for me to get there. If I even wanted to get there, it wouldn't be an easy thing. Right? Because, I mean, I'm just a, a minion. And these people are the elites. And they don't want anything. And yet here, the very God of the universe 
is available to enjoy fellowship with me any time of the day. You don't look like that. It's such a staggering thought, but it really is a staggering thought, isn't it? So we go into verse 5 now, having began his introduction, and already he's, I think, done some devastating things in his introduction to these false teachers. Then he says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is light, in him is no darkness at all. Now, it's amazing, uh, the, the message that he's giving. Now, he's going to talk about God is love, Later on in the book, chapter 4, verse 8, we read this. It says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. But before he reveals God is love to us, he tells us God is light. And of course, the idea of God is light is the idea of the holiness of God. And isn't it nice, though? God is light, and I like this. In him is no darkness at all. Not one bit. Wouldn't it be a terrible shock if sometime further into eternity we learned that there was a dark, sinister side to God that we didn't realize? But we will never, ever experience that. Because in him is no darkness at all. No dark side. God is light. And he reveals, first of all, the holiness of God, and that's important before he goes on and speaks about the love of God. And I, again, I, I suspect that the more we understand the holiness of God, the more we'll realize the love of God. Because in terms of the holiness of God, um, we also recognize we're not holy. We're sinners, right? There's, there's a lot of darkness in this heart of mine, and so here's this holy God, and here's the darkness. And, and so uh, amazing uh, that... How can I walk with this being when he's so holy? And it's because of his love, he's, he's made a way possible that somebody who's so dark can enjoy somebody who's filled with light. And so it says, the message is this, God is light, in him is no darkness at all, no dark side at all. And then he says, if we say. Now, I want you to notice something, because this is the first of seven such times where he's going to talk about this language of profession and again uh, part of it is going directly against these false teachers because these are kind of things that they were saying okay and he's going to deal with those statements so notice verse 6 if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness notice verse 8 if we say we have no sin verse 10 if we say that we have not sinned chapter 2 verse 4 he that saith Chapter 2, verse 6, he that saith, chapter 2 and verse 9, he that saith, he is in the light and hates his brother, is in darkness even till now. And then there's one more, there's a seventh one in verse 20, if a man say, I love God and hates his brother. Okay, so, so it's good. Again, this is where the underlining comes in. This is where they're kind of paying attention to these phrases. So there are people that are, uh, it's the language of profession. People are saying these things. And yet, uh, and again, part of it influenced by this false teaching. And he wants to correct some of these false ideas. And so he, he says, if we say we have fellowship with him. And remember these Gnostics, particularly the ones that were the Libertines, they claimed that they had this special knowledge and this special relationship with God, but it, they were living completely sinful lives because that as long as, as long as you're in communion with God, doesn't matter how you live. Well, he's really hitting that right here, isn't he? He says, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. We're not practicing the truth. And, and so it matters how we walk, doesn't it? If we say we have fellowship with him and he's light and we're walking in darkness, then how can, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? He's light. I'm walking in darkness. There's a disagreement here. Light and dark are always separated in Scripture. You go back to Genesis, first thing that's separated. Uh, you know, kind of, there's, there's a separation there. The light 
from the darkness. And so if I'm walking with him, one of the evidences that I'm really walking with him is I'm going to walk in the light as he is in the light. And I'm going to stay away from darkness and all the things that are pertaining to the powers of darkness. I'm going to stay away from that. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. Then we're not doing the truth. We're not practicing the truth. Walking in the light. Notice um, he, he says in verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And so we're, we're walking in harmony. You see, if, if, if I've got intentional, intentional wickedness and sin in my life, my fellowship with God is greatly affected. He's holy, right? And, and so to enjoy communion with him, I have to walk in the light. I can't be walking in ways of darkness. And so he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Interesting that we have fellowship one with another. It's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? We have fellowship one with another. You see, if, if I'm walking closely to the Lord, and I'm walking in the light, and you're walking in sin, even though we may both be believers, we don't enjoy that intimacy of fellowship. In fact, when we put somebody out of fellowship, they've already been out of fellowship for a long time. All we're doing is making actual that which has been going on for a long time. We're not enjoying that intimacy because they're living in sin. And so, <laughs> he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. It not only affects our fellowship with the Lord, it affects our fellowship with one another. When you're walking with believers that are serious about holiness and, and walking with the Lord, there's, a, there's much more genuine real fellowship than those that are not serious about those things. And so it, it hinders fellowship. We have fellowship one with another. And then it says an interesting thing. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Why would it, why would it say that at this point if you're walking in the light? Why does it say, when you walk in the light as he is in the light, <laughs> we have fellowship one with another, and then it says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, the more you walk in the light, and the closer you get to the light, what does light always expose? Every little bit of dirt. So we've talked about this before. It's hard to imagine it today because of the gray skies, but here's the diligent housewife, and she cleans house, and it looks beautiful, and she's really happy with her work. And then a shaft of sunlight comes through the window, and what do you see? Yeah, I thought you cleaned the house. Dust everywhere. Look at the dust here, right? And what happened? The light shining brightly exposed every particle of dirt, didn't it? And what I find is the closer you get to the Lord, the more he reveals to you things in your own heart you never even realized was there. And there, there's aspects of our depravity and sinfulness we had no idea of until we got close to the Lord. And then suddenly we realized, Lord, I, I knew I was a wretch, but I never realized how much of a wretch I really was. And I'm thankful that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses me from all sin. Now, just a, another, we're almost done. I'm just going to say one more thing, and then we'll close in prayer because our time is gone. But John loved the Old Testament. And his writings, there are allusions to the Old Testament in all of the writings of John. So you read his gospel, and everything revolves around the feasts. Leviticus 23 and the Feast of Jehovah and John's Gospel just meld together. He, he, everything revolves around the festivals. When you come to the book of Revelation, it's all tabernacle teaching. It's amazing how much tabernacle teaching there is in the book of Revelation. Here in 1 John, I think we're on the Day of Atonement. So you remember when the priest, he goes into the holies of all just once a year. Remember how he does that once a year? And when he goes into the first, you know, the holy place, well, in the holy place, there's a light, isn't there? There's the 
menorah. There's a seven branch lampstand. So everything's lit up there. But, but then there's another veil. And beyond that veil, what is the light through that veil? No artificial light. What is the light in there? It's the Shekinah glory of God that lights up. And he's got to go in there, pitch black apart from the glory of God. And so when he goes in there, he wouldn't dare just to walk in. Here I am. What does he do? Before he, he starts sprinkling blood. And then he goes in, into the light. And so as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, and of course, thankfully, the veil was rent at Calvary, wasn't it? Aren't you glad that that... So that means we can have access to his presence all the time. But that access to his presence, he's still light. <laughs> you know, we still have dark. And so the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin, makes it possible for us to enjoy this intimacy and communion with God. Without the blood, <laughs> we would be vaporized instantaneously. And so, just interesting, isn't it, that they've got these little illusions. They're very real. They're very, they're, you've got to remember, your, your New Testament writers were men who were steeped in the Old Testament. That was their Bible. And you cannot read the New Testament without seeing the Old Testament scriptures bleeding through on every page. We just have to look for the blood as it bleeds through. It's there. So, walking in the light as he is in the light. Well, our time is gone. I trust that we realize that it's important to not get sidetracked with new things and hold fast to that which was from the beginning. There's no advance on this. This is amazing. The manifestation of the eternal Son of God into the world revealed to ordinary people. The enjoyment of walking in fellowship with him who is light. It doesn't get better than this. The enjoyment of communion with divine persons. These are amazing things. There's, there's nothing a cultist can offer you that is in advance on that which is from the beginning. It doesn't get better than this. So the idea is this. Be joyful at what you have. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful for our little time this morning or this afternoon in the Word of God. We pray, Father, again, that these truths may be ones that we have thought about before, but they'll come with a freshness and uh, uh, just be precious to our hearts to think about all that has been done for us through that blessed man of Calvary, the Lord Jesus, the one who was indeed the eternal Son of God who came into this world, took on humanity, and went to a, a, a cruel cross to bear our sin in his own body on that tree so that we might have fellowship with thee. Oh, Father, how grateful we are. We thank thee for these things in the name of the Lord Jesus, for his glory. Amen.